Good morning. Good morning, everyone in here in church and everyone at Facebook. Uh, I'd like to go over today's announcements here with you real quick. Uh, we appreciate you uh, coming in here to Piney Level and appreciate you tuning in to us on Facebook as well. Uh, just go over today's announcements here with you real quick. Um, we're having a business meeting this Wednesday, July the 1st at 7 o'clock in the sanctuary. Uh, this is to catch up on uh, church business since we've been unable to meet uh, since March. So uh, there will be some, a few things to catch up on. Uh, please continue to pray for the church as we continue to follow the Lord's leadership uh, in these decisions. And uh, I just pray that uh, you would uh, be able to, if you can attend, we would truly appreciate that if you're able to make it out here. Like I say, we will be in the sanctuary, so we'll all be sort of separated out. And there is some business to go over that's uh, been pending for a while and rather important to go over. So please keep that in mind. Uh, further into announcements, I um, want to remind all the youth that uh, Wednesdays uh, in July from 6 to 8-ish, I say 8-ish, um, here at mine and Amy's house, uh, we have the pool parties, uh, will be uh, as long as the weather, it'll be outside as long as the weather is good, uh, it'll go inside if the weather is bad, uh, but we do plan on having Wednesday nights at our house with the youth. Um, throughout the month of July. So keep that in mind if you would. Uh, also remember the uh, woman's prayer group for the next couple of months will be meeting in the church on the first Monday at 6.30, the third Thursday at 10 a.m. each month. So please keep that in mind as well. Um, this is one that kind of breaks my heart right here. Uh, after much discussion and even more in prayer, the planning committee has decided to cancel the VBS for this year, for the 2020 VBS. So please keep that in mind. If you know somebody that normally likes to try to attend, if you don't mind, just let them know. That would be great. Um, we will, however, consider some type of community event later on this year if conditions improve. So please keep that in mind as well. Thank you for praying. Uh, this has been a, a long process right here. We do appreciate everyone's willingness to step up and help any way you have in the past, uh, but we do ask that you continue to pray for the following VBS. Hopefully we'll have another one in 2021, so please keep that in mind. Um, also remember the prayer box, uh, prayer request box outside next to the mailbox. Um, we'd love to have your prayer request uh, made known to us. Uh, you ain't got to put your name on there if you don't feel comfortable with that, but also your praise. Um, that gives us a little energy when we're praying for you, uh, that if we've been praying for something and something comes to fruition for you uh, that God has blessed you with. We just pray that uh, you would uh, share that with us as well and let us uh, embellish in your, in your uh, happiness right there of a blessing being answered right there. So um, is there anything else that needs to be went over? Off oh, offering, I'm sorry, I've got it even written down here, Pastor. Uh, today's offering will go toward the building fund maintenance, uh, so we uh, would pray that you would give with your heart and not your mind. We would just pray that uh, we can continue to work with the building and, and supplement the building fund. And let's just put this in perspective, building fund is the building maintenance of this building. And there are several projects that are probably going to come up um, in the next little bit, um, and it requires obviously money, um, but we do appreciate you very much on, uh, on your building fund offerings, and uh, remember it is to the maintenance of this building, so anything else? May God bless you all. faces out there, uh, some that we haven't seen in a while, uh, and, but we just thank the Lord for this day that he's given us. Just We need to just praise him and glorify him. A uh, lot of areas in our country that are, are really struggling, and uh, you know, remember our communities. Uh, and I pray that, let's remember our governmental officials, our school officials that are trying to make decisions on what to do with school this fall. You know, I know they think they, they make decisions and then the next day things turn around and, and they're having to rethink a lot of things. 
pray for them. You know, church, we need to realize that ultimately God's in control. We need to submit to his leadership, to his authority, and just praise him and glorify him. It's good to be in the Lord's house today. You know, uh, I think about the scripture where it says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Uh, we should be glad. We should be glad that it's, it's Sunday morning, that it's a time that we have set aside to praise and glorify our Father who is in heaven because he is worthy. So join me as we pray this morning, church. Father, I just want to thank you. Thank you and praise you for who you are and, God, for what you are doing. Lord, realizing that, uh, Lord, without you, we wouldn't be anything. Lord, we would have no hope. God, that we would have no direction. God, we would have nothing. And, Father, I just praise you for the fact that you loved us so much that while we were yet in our sins that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. God, I pray for all these that are struggling with sicknesses. Lord, there's so many. And I know, Father, we get so wrapped up in this, vir in this virus that we sometimes forget about our loved ones that are going through uh, cancer treatments, that are going through heart disease, and, God, are just struggling with life. I, I pray today that you would just help us God, that we would slow down, that we would leave the cares and the troubles of this world behind. And God, that we would look up to you. God, help us in this time, God, to truly worship you. God, to truly realize that the songs that we're about to sing, Father, it's not about how good we sing. It's about who we're singing to. And Father, we're singing to you. We're bringing glory and honor to you. And Father, I pray that every word that's spoken, every thought that's in our heart, everything that's done today would bring glory and honor to you and be pleasing to you. And all these things we'd ask in Christ's name. Amen. Stand up and sing along with us. Yeah, yeah this is this.
five <coughs> verses out of a four verse song when you have two people singing different verses. That was for you, John. <laughs> Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear?
first want to say I appreciate these girls for doing this for me. You know, I've really worn these young ladies out, asking them to do something every Sunday morning for the last, how long has it been now? I don't even know. I've lost count. Um, so having said that, um, it looks like we're going to be continuing this type of worship time of format. So if you have something that you feel led to sing, something you want to sing, please don't wait for me to ask you. It is an open invitation. If you have a special you want to sing, I will put you in and gladly remove myself uh, from singing something. Um, so um, I want um, you to use your talents that the Lord's given you. So um, please let me know if there's something that you want to sing. Gabe, I'm looking at you just in case you're wondering. Okay. So uh, anyway, this one is actually a song that um, Sharon Pelfrey asked me to learn about, oh gosh, probably more than a year ago. Um, so, um, just so you know my timeline, it takes me about a year to get ready to sing something. Not really, but, you know, sometimes it takes a little while. So, anyway, sometimes it's more about not the song itself, but when it's the right time that the Lord wants you to sing it. So, um, Angela and I were here this week, and we had actually planned on doing something else. But when, I, when we practiced, I told her, I said, no, this is the one we're going to do this week. So, I hope you enjoy it. It's called He Welcomes the Beggar.
It's good to be in the Lord's house today and just thank the Lord for uh, his many blessings. Um, just, uh, it's, I don't know about you guys, but it's been a, a difficult week uh, in our household. It's been a, a difficult, uh, there's been challenges, it seems like, on every hand. And, but uh, in, I, I kind of wrestled with whether I was going to give this, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to give you all an assignment this week in preparation for next Sunday morning. Because next Sunday morning, and I haven't told Laura this yet, I don't think. I've just shared with some others. But I want us to sing a, a song called, How Can I Keep From Singing? And I want you to listen to it this week. Go on YouTube. Chris Tomlin sings this song uh, this week. Uh, you know, Brendan and I have been singing that song. And... You see all the problems and the heartaches and troubles in this world. But there's still, for the child of God, there's an endless song that echoes in my heart. <laughs> there's just something that, how can we keep from singing His praise? I ask you that, uh, that question. This week as you listen to that, when, when all the things are going on in the world and all the craziness is happening in the world... Church, how can we keep from singing His praise? Uh, everything that He has done for us, there should be an endless song that, that we should praise Him and glorify Him. I know that times are hard. Uh, I was telling them I've got friends in Texas that, that, uh, that work in hospitals and that are just having, uh, they're being overrun with the virus. I know there's violence in our communities and in our cities around the nation. There's... Uh, families here in our own community are uh, dealing with uh, cancer and dealing with uh, death in their families and death in their households. But, uh, but for a child of God, how can we keep from singing His praise? Because you've heard me say this before. The worst that we will ever face as a child of God, we'll face it here. The glory is coming and awaiting the children of God. And that was just a little side note. It's not, that's not the sermon. Uh, that's just something that God has laid on my heart. But uh, I ask you this week, just when things are going rough, listen to that song and just sing, how can I keep from singing His praise? He's worthy. He is worthy to be praised in times of storm, in times of good, in times uh, when the darkness closes in that we just don't know what direction we're going to turn. He is worthy. If you have your Bibles, and certainly hope that you do, and, and those out there uh, listening to us online, uh, please get your Bibles and, and don't just depend on my reading, but look at it yourself. Uh, we'll turn to the book of Colossians, third chapter, 7th through 14th verse, and I hope that you've been enjoying Colossians nearly as much as I have because uh, it has been a, a very good book, a very timely book for me anyway. It seems like everywhere I look, you know, there's troubles and heartaches. And, but Colossians 3, verses 7 through 14. Uh, and uh, I, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer and then I'll read the scripture and get right on into this. Father, thank you. God, that there is an endless song that echoes God, throughout our heart, throughout our soul, throughout our very being, Father, for you are worthy. God, that we need to praise you and glorify you even in times of trouble. Father, I, I think about how that in the Old Testament, when the, you went into battle, Father, the very first ones you sent were the musicians singing your praise. Father, we need to realize that we go into battle today singing your praise because the victory is assured through Christ Jesus. Father, I praise you and I thank you for who you are. I pray that you would help us to lay aside the things of this world today. Just focus on you. And God, that every word that's spoken, God, that you would remove me out of the way and you speak through me today. Father, we love you, praise you, and thank you. In all this I'd ask in Christ's glorious name. Amen. Colossians. Chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. And it says, In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, 
wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together uh, in perfect harmony. And, you know, as I was reading this and thinking about it, and if you remember last week we were talking about up there earlier in the chapter when uh, Paul was talking to them about the sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, uh, idolatry, uh, those things that were uh, in the church at that time, those things that they were dealing with, those things that uh, were causing problems as Paul was talking about them. Uh, but Paul told them the wrath of God's coming. He said, because of your sin. Uh, church, we need to realize that uh, the wrath of God is coming. And sometimes it's easy for us as church people, and I, and I use that term church people, uh, to look out and see the drunkards and the uh, addicts and the sexually immoral and uh, the, the child molesters, the, the, all these uh, wicked people that we say it's easy for us to look at them and feel somehow superior. But if you look over in the book of James, the first chapter, 23rd and 24th verse, James is speaking to the children of, uh, to the church at that time. It says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Uh, James was telling the church there that he was writing to, he said, you know, sometimes we forget uh, what we are like. We forget what uh, we were formerly like. We forget the fact that we were those people. Uh, we were those sinners that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are those that, just like these others, uh, we are just like those. We forget that. Paul is trying to get across to the church the very same thing then, that the church of Colossae, trying to get across to the church of Piney Level today, the very same thing. Church, when we look at this mirror of God's Word, I'm not saying that we need to grovel in or we need to remain in or we need to uh, 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 feel sorry about our past, but what we need to do is we don't need to forget when we look at others and we don't need to judge others harshly uh, because we were the very same way before we came to Christ. We uh, uh, were in the very same uh, condition. We were lost without hope. Paul wrote there, he says, In these you too once walked. Think about that. You may say, well, preacher, I was never sexually immoral, and preacher, I was never uh, uh, an idol worshiper. What did you put before Jesus? What did you do that hindered you from walking in the Word of God? What did we do as a people? And church, I, I have to say that when we look at that and we understand that as Paul was writing to the church there, uh, he was telling them, we don't need to get so wrapped up in ourselves and so puffed up in ourselves and so uh, 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 caught up in our own uh, that we look at everybody else from a different standpoint. We need to ask God, God give us your eyes that we would see. And I was thinking about uh, when Christ Jesus was sitting overlooking Jerusalem and it's a verse that I think about often in church. I think sometimes we have lost that uh, compassion that we should have for our people in this world today. When Jesus looked out over Jerusalem... And he began to weep and began to cry over Jerusalem. He didn't say, I'm bringing God's wrath down on you because you are an unworthy, undeserving people. What did he say? He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, those that have stoned the prophets and killed those that I have sent, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen would gather her brood, but you would not. He said, I, he was weeping, broken hearted, over the fact that he was calling out to them 
Church, that's the very same thing in our world today. We should be weeping and, 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 and crying out for those that are living in this sinful condition. Paul told them, he said, you, if in these you too once walked when you were living in them and you were living in the world and you were living in that manner. He says, but now you must put them all away. In church, he's getting into some things that probably every last one of us deals with from time to time. He says, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, Malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Uh, he's going even deeper. He is uh, talking about things that probably every one of us, and I hear people say when I preach here, you know, those are just human nature. Those are things that, uh, that we battle in the flesh. Yes, amen, we do. But church, you know what? Uh, sometimes we quit battling and we give in. That uh, We need to keep battling these things. We need to realize that the only way that we can battle these things is through Jesus. It's easy for some time for us to, as I said earlier, for us to look down at the sexually immoral, the drunkards, the addicts, the, the thieves, all these others, and kind of just glaze over the fact that we're living in anger. You know, and uh, I've admitted the other night, you know, it's, it seems like that I see things on the news and, and anger wants to well up in me. And that's not of God. We shouldn't be that way. Uh, wrath, you begin to say, God, when are you going to bring judgment on them? Church, we should uh, be crying out for God to uh, be patient and for God to be long-suffering and uh, for Him to give them a chance because we need to realize uh, that if God's wrath were to be poured out on this world today, where would a lot of our loved ones spend eternity? What would become the people, our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones that don't know Jesus? Paul is telling them that it's easy for us to look at those things. It's easy for us to, to, to go out and, and we pick and choose the things that we think that are not so bad. It's not so bad uh, uh, to do these things. But I was reading this past week and I, I read this little uh, thing from Charles Spurgeon and I love this. And I want you to listen to what Spurgeon said because uh, we need to remember who it is that Paul is talking to here. Uh, he's not talking to the lost in the world. This is not an evangelical message uh, out in the square, out in the street corner. This is a letter to who? To the church, to the believers. This is a letter to Piney Level, if you would. And years ago, God began to show me that every time that I look at these and I look at these letters to these churches, instead of looking at them to the church of Colossae, I need to look at the church that we are today and say, God, what do you want us to see in that letter for us today? Because it's easy to judge the church of Colossae. It's hard to look at our own self. If you go back up to that scripture in James I read, we forget that we're just the very same way. But Charles Spurgeon wrote this. <coughs> he said, Christian, what hast thou to do with sin? Hath it not cost thee enough already? Burnt child, will thou play with fire? What? When thou hast already been between the jaws of the lion, wilt thou step a second time into his den? Hast thou not had enough of the old serpent? Did he not poison all thy veins once? But inasmuch as sin did never give thee what it promised to bestow, but deluded thee with lies, be not a second time snared by the old fowler. Be free. Let the remembrance of thy ancient bondage forbid thee to enter the net again. He's saying we should remember these snares that we were in. And, and I was thinking about that. And, uh, you know, those of you that have trapped things before and uh, realize you can go out there and you can trap an animal and you turn it loose. Uh, uh, after a little while, it becomes trap-wise, doesn't it? Uh, it sees the trap. It recognizes it. It understands that uh, if I go in that thing, there's going to be uh, consequences to this. And uh, church, we need to be that way. We need to understand that when sin is there, we keep touching that hot stove, what's going to happen? We're going to keep getting burnt. We keep playing with that serpent, we're going to get bit again and again. We need to understand that we keep sticking our foot in that trap, we're going to get snared over and over. Paul is saying we need to put these things away. We need to walk away from the uh, 
anger, the wrath, the malice, the slander, the obscene talk. And we need to remember uh, who it is that we are supposed to follow. If you read over in the book of, of uh, Revelation, the second chapter, the fifth verse, Jesus is writing to the church uh, at Ephesus. And again, church, we need to remember, well, who is this? It's Jesus speaking to the church. Uh, he's telling the church at Ephesus, a church that had been a pi- powerful, a mighty church, a, 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 an example to all those around us. But in Revelation 2, 5, Jesus said, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus is saying, Remember. Remember, don't, you've been snared again by sin. Uh, uh, you've been uh, uh, trapped again by the wiles of Satan. Remember uh, who it is. Remember uh, who it is that you live for. Remember uh, the work that I called you to do. Remember uh, from where that you came and, and repent to God that you might return there. Church, we as a nation, you know, Brother Ted and I were talking out there a little earlier. You know, we look around and we see all the craziness going on. Don't you think that God is trying to open our eyes? Don't you think that God is saying, remember where it is that you need to be. Remember who it is that you're supposed to be following. Lay aside the things of this world. Lay aside the the, the slander, the anger, the wrath, the malice, the the obscene language. Lay aside all of these things and... Uh, Church, we need to repent uh, and turn back. And so many times uh, I've heard people say, Well, preacher, you know, my language doesn't matter. You know, I just get angry and words come out. Church, our language matters. What does it say up there at the end of that? It says, An obscene talk from your mouth. I've been at churches and I've heard people speak uh, that were claimed to be... uh, uh, born-again believers and their language would make you blush. It, it, it would make cold chills run all over you. And I was reading this past week and uh, a, a guy that I began to read, Richard Chin, and he uh, made this comment and he said so many times we don't think about our language and we don't think about, he said, in our society today, our postings, our writings, our social media and things. He said, but before we ever speak, uh, before we ever write, before we ever post, He said, you should let your words pass through these five questions. Is it truthful? Is it helpful? Is it informative? Is it necessary? And is it kind? You know, there'd be a lot more silence in this world today if every one of us passed everything through that. Because we'd have a whole lot less to say. The news medias would be, instead of 24 hours a day, they'd maybe be two, three hours a day. Because instead of inciting anger and inciting violence and inciting uh, sinful conditions, if it all passed through those, it'd be a whole lot less said. Church, we, as the children of God, need to realize that our words do matter. Our words do. I used to teach a class in the prisons and, and, and people would talk about language and I was talking to these men about how they spoke to their children and I'd ask them this question. I'd say, uh, do you ever remember something that was spoken to you in your childhood uh, that you still remember today? Something negative said to you. And almost every time, every last man would raise a hand. Now they would have something negative that was said to them, something evil was said to them. They remembered it years and years and years. And I says, what about injuries in your childhood? And boy, and except for major injuries, they couldn't remember. They didn't remember that, you know, sprained ankle. They didn't remember that uh, falling out of a tree. They didn't remember those things, but they remembered those hurt hearts from that language, from that speech, from those words. We need to understand that when God saves us, He wants to change all of of us. Back in 1904, 1905, there was a great revival in Wales. It was called the Welsh uh, Revival. It it hit, and they said over that two-year period of time, about 150,000 people came to Christ. And uh, they were coal miners that were, they said, the vilest, the most wicked, the most evil men 
uh, that you could think of says that their language was awful. But this was written about these men after revival spread throughout this region. Soul winning spread through the coal mines. Profane swearing stopped. Productivity in the mines increased. Even the pit ponies were confused by the change in their master's behavior as coaxing replaced the kicking and the cursing. It says that when the revival spread through their language, uh, their anger, the, the, the way they treated even the very animals, you know, uh, uh, changed and said people noticed these things, even the animals noticed these things. Church, we need to realize that when God gets a hold of us, when Christ Jesus uh, gets inside us and begins to stir us and begins to uh, mold us and make us and change us into who He desires us to be, these things begin to go away. They begin to change. And His desire is to change us and make us so that when people, like the song that we sang earlier as a congregation, they will know. Why? By our love. They will know we are Christians. They will know we belong to Him by our love. He says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. You know, God renews us with knowledge of Him and church. Uh, uh, that's one of the things that we have uh, taken today and we have uh, changed it and we have made it. And uh, so many people will tell us and say, well, you know, preacher, I know the word, uh, the, the, the Bible may say that, but this is just a book that uh, kind of gives us some instructions. Church, we either believe that this is the infallible, inerrant, uh, uh, unchanging word of God or we don't. Uh, we either believe that it is worthy to be followed uh, to every jot and every tittle, or we don't. Uh, we either would believe that it is an instruction that God has given us, or we don't. We can't be both ways. He said this knowledge that we have, this knowledge of the Word of God, He changes us and molds us and makes us into that new creation. And, and Paul, uh, earlier in the chapter, he was telling them about all these practices and things that they had done. But if you read over in the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Think about the good things of Christ. Live in the good things of Christ. Live in the truth of Christ. Live in the honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent and worthy things that are worthy of praise. Church, we need to be living in those things today. I know that... Uh, some people say, well, you uh, are, are espousing that Christians should go through life with rose-colored glasses on. Uh, church, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying that we shouldn't be so clouded by the things of the world uh, that we miss out on the joy and the glory that God has, uh, that we miss out on the good things that uh, Christ Jesus is doing for His children. We need to look to these and remember these, and we need to understand that church that that we live in the truth because Satan is a lie. If you read back in John, the 8th chapter, the 44th verse, when Jesus was speaking about Satan, what did he say? He said, you are of your father the devil. He is speaking to who at that time? He is speaking to church people. I'm not saying he is speaking to Christians. He is uh, uh, speaking to religious leaders of that day in church. There's a big difference between being a religious person and being a child of God. You can be religious all day long. But when you become a child of God, you've given control of your life over to Jesus. You have submitted your life totally to Jesus for Him to take control and mold you and make you and make into what He'd have you to be. But Jesus said there, speaking to the religious leaders, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, 
for he is a liar and the father of lies. And But then in contrast to the Satan, go over to the book of Titus, the first chapter, the first and second verse, when Paul is writing to Titus and uh, writing about uh, uh, God, it says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Uh, Church, you want to see the difference there? Uh, The Bible says that Satan always lies and that God never lies. Uh, That whatever God speaks is true uh, and everlasting. Whatever Satan speaks uh, uh, is a lie from the beginning because he is a lie. He's the father of a lie and his desire is to deceive you and lead you into destruction. Paul is telling them, says, don't lie to one another. Because when you lie to one another, who are you exhibiting? You're exhibiting the characteristics of Satan. Church, we need to tell the truth. We need to be a truthful people, a loving people, a people that loves one another because that that is how they'll know that we're His, that we tell the truth in love. It says, here there is no Jew or Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And we need to remember what happened there at the beginning. When we started out the beginning of the book of Colossians, Paul is talking about all these pagan philosophers and uh, all these uh, Judaizers that were saying, uh, in order to be a child of God, you've got to be circumcised. In order to be a child of God, you've got to be outwardly a Jew first, and then you can become this thing. Uh, But the Word of God is saying here, that these are not the things that you have to do. He said, for in this, uh, there is not Greek nor Jew. There is not circumcised or uncircumcised. There is not barbarian or Scythian or slave uh, or free. He says, there's none of these. He said, because when we look at them all, it's just what Peter said in the book of Acts, 10th chapter, 34th and 35th verse. It says, so Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, But in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. Church, He didn't say anyone who uh, uh, does what is right and is acceptable to Him. Uh, He said He didn't say anyone that does that plus is circumcised or plus is from this tribe or plus is from this family. Uh, He says anyone, no matter the nation, no matter the community... And when I was reading this and it was talking about these Scythians there and you would say, why would he go along there and talk about circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians and Scythians? Uh, Those Scythians were even worse than barbarians. Scythians were a people that came from just north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and they were a a, a vile and they were a wicked and they were a very uh, uh, they were a people that said that uh, that they didn't just uh, kill their uh, enemies that they tortured them before Uh, they made a sport out of it that they uh, tortured them and they slayed them and not only did they do that but then they dismembered their bodies and used uh, uh, body parts as utensils for eating and uh, drinking. Uh, uh, Church, these were wicked, wicked uh, uh, people. But what is Paul saying? Don't matter. God don't look at them and say that was a wicked, wicked. He says they're either his or they're not. He said I don't separate them in that way. You're either a child of God or you're not. You're either Christ is in you or he's not. You're either living for Jesus or you're not. Church, today in our world, you know, people are trying to divide in ethnicity. See, people are trying to divide by race. They're trying to divide by culture. They're trying to divide by so many things. But you know what our Lord doesn't do? Uh, He doesn't listen to our accents because I tell everybody, you know, uh, if He did, boy, we'd be messed up because most people, if you don't live in the South, you can't understand us because of our accent. Uh, uh, And every time I was teaching in Michigan, I'd have to find somebody that could be an interpreter for me up there uh, because they had a hard time understanding me. Uh, Church, God doesn't look at us that way. God looks at our heart. He sees uh, whether we are of Christ or not. He knows whether we have the love of God in our heart, whether the love of God is in our life. 
And then he tells us, he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Earlier, if you read, what does he say up there in these verses? If you read back up in uh, verses uh, 5 and, and 6, he's talking about all the wickedness, uh, all the terrible things. You look down in verse 8, he's talking about all the wickedness and all the terrible things. And Now you look up there in verse 12 and 13, what is he saying? He said, as a child of God, put on these things, uh, holy, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience bearing one another, forgiving one another. He, what is he saying? He says all these other things are gone. They should be replaced by all of these things if we're a child of God. Jesus told us in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15 about forgiveness. He says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. That's exactly what Paul uh, is telling them up uh, there at the end of verse 13, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Church, it's not a question if we should forgive. Uh, the, uh, it is a mandate that if we're a child of God that we have forgiveness. Uh, uh, he didn't say it would be easy and in our power we can't do this thing. In our power we can't let go of uh, past hurts. Uh, but it's only through the blood of Christ Jesus and through the love of Jesus that we can love one another in a manner that we can forgive one another. And cause it that verse 14 and he says, Above all these put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, So now faith, hope, love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is what? Love. Love. John MacArthur made this statement. He said, Love is the most important moral quality in the believer's life. For it is the very glue that produces unity in the church. Believers will never enjoy mutual fellowship through compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, or patience. They will not bear with each other or forgive each other unless they love one another. Church, all of these virtues that we read about, they don't create love. Love creates them. The love of God creates them in our life. How do you have kindness and compassion and, and forgiveness to somebody that has done you wrong? The love of Christ living and abiding in your life. How? It's the same way that when Jesus was hanging on the cross of Calvary and they had nailed spikes in his hands and his feet and they had put a crown of thorns on his head and they had beat him till he was unrecognizable and he was hanging there and they were mocking him and everything that they had did to him what did he do? Did he say, Father, send fire down that destroy them? He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Church, we need to forgive in the very same manner because the lost of this world, they don't know what they're doing. They're blinded by the things of Satan. They're blinded by his lies, by his ways. They don't know what they're doing. But as a child of God, we need to love one another as Christ loves us. If you'll get us a song, the Lord's about done with us. Church, I hope and pray that you look at what God has called us to do. As you read the book of Colossians, you know, I, I'm not going to stand up here and... and be one that says we're going to change the Word of God. No, but I'm going to say, look at it as though it were too piney level until the church, instead of the church at Colossae. Because it is. His Word is for our instruction. It wasn't just for them in that day, and then it's just a history book now. It continues to be for your instruction, for my instruction. 
while we stand and sing a verse of a song, if you need to pray today, if you're dealing with these things, and church, I know so many times so we, we deal with these things, that, uh, the anger and the malice and the slander and the envy and the strife and the obscene language and people deal with these things. The only way you're ever going to overcome them is surrender them to Jesus. Surrender them to Jesus and allow Him to take them and make you what you need to be. While we sing, if you need to pray today, won't you come? If you don't know this Jesus and have that love in your heart, won't you come while we sing? Go ahead. 